Empathy. A word that we're all aware of. I mean, at least I'd assume we're aware of. Now I'm a cold-hearted bitch, so I don't really cry at the misfortune of others, but when I was younger, I particularly remember prominent moments where I felt overcome by what I perceived to be empathy, such as crying at the first Pokemon movie at age 10 when Ash is turned to stone and Pikachu cries over his body. The film is older than me, it's your fault if you haven't seen it. Or at age 11, crying whilst reading Twilight New Moon when Bella is abandoned by Edward and she feels like there's a void in her life. I wasn't thinking about how Bella or Pikachu felt. I didn't cognitively think about how it must be to be like them in their situation and the thoughts going through their heads or the feelings that they must be experiencing. Experiences similar to these are generally what most people would consider a moment of empathy, the idea of relating to another's experiences or feeling what they are feeling. In fact, I didn't know that that wasn't exactly what empathy was until I really started thinking about it a few weeks ago. My biggest go-to when protesting injustice or cruelty, especially online, is to have empathy, to be a decent person. I constantly find myself getting angry at the fact that other people just can't seem to empathise with others or try to consider their feelings from their point of view. And then it hit me, it must be because most people don't even know what empathy is. The extent to which we can empathise with others can vary, and people's levels of empathy can shift depending on their mood, the people involved, and the situations that they find themselves in. But that doesn't mean to say that some of us are completely incapable of it, even if we find it difficult to sustain. The word Eifenlung, later translated as empathy, was used by the late 19th century German philosophers when discussing the philosophy of aesthetics. One of the earliest appearances of the word was in 1846 when philosopher Robert Vischer used Eifenlong to describe and discuss the pleasure that we experienced when contemplating a work of art. Here the word represented an attempt to describe our ability to get inside a work of beauty by, for example, projecting ourselves and our feelings into a painting, a sculpture, a piece of music, or even the beauty of nature itself. This idea of understanding the world by contemplating art and nature was also prominent in the earlier literature movements such as Romanticism of the late 18th and early 19th centuries. For those of you who don't really have much knowledge or background in English literature, these are your John Keats, your Thomas Hardy's, this is your Frankenstein and Dracula era of literature. Reacting against what they saw as the impersonal logic of the new Enlightenment sciences, the Romantics agreed that though it was possible to explain nature, science and its objectivity had nothing to say about what it feels like to be in the world, what it is to experience life. The view came that experience outbids explanation when it came to human affairs. And from the phenomenological perspective, this is true. You can't objectively define feeling. We we can try to explain it and possibly describe it, but we cannot fully capture what emotions are unless we experience them for ourselves. And even then, people's experience of the same feeling can differ greatly. Within this time frame of literature, there was this emergence of literary works of reflective and autobiographical nature. As writers began to analyse the self with increasing honesty, we begin to see the growth of what David Ho called the modern, empathic mind. The aesthetic stance set the scene for the major shift in the world being understood not from the outside looking in, but from the inside looking out. This insight also appealed to the social scientists, who began to recognise empathy's potential to help them understand human experience from the subject's point of view. In 1909, the psychologist Edward Titchener was the first to use the term empathy, the English translation of the German word Eifenlong. It originated from the Greek word empatheia, meaning to enter feelings from the outside or to be with a person's feelings, passions or sufferings. 
If we are to understand people and their situations rather than simply explain them, we need to begin to interpret and find meaning. But this is still quite an abstract way of talking about empathy. And to find a definition, it depends on who you ask, the definitions that you read, and what academic department that you are researching in, if you can go as far as having access to those materials. Put simply, empathy can be understood as one or more of several loosely related processes of mental states. Some of the most popular definitions include the following, feeling what someone else feels, caring about somebody else, being emotionally affected by someone else's emotions and experiences, though not necessarily experiencing the same emotions, imagining oneself in another situation, imagining being another in that other situation, making inferences about another's mental states or some combination of the processes described. However, many academics point out that to insist that the person who is experiencing empathy must have the same kind of state as the person who they are empathising with is to miss what is distinctive about empathy, namely the fact that it is a special form of other-directed intentionality, one that allows the other's experience to reveal themselves as other rather than their own. Basically, if that was too complicated to understand, empathy allows us to experience what another is experiencing whilst keeping us detached from that situation. Your experience is not literally transmitted to me, and I do not undergo the experience that I observe in you. Instead, to empathically experience the emotions of another necessarily differs from the way you would experience that emotion if it were your own. There is a certain awareness in empathy that you are not the one living through these experiences, but that they belong to the other, that they are the other's experiences, and that they are only given to you by expressive phenomena. Even if we, by coincidence, had had the same kind of experiences, this would not amount to a shared experience or to an experience we were facing together. The experience which psychologists refer to as personal distress is what a lot of people convolute with sympathy or empathy. In this experience, though your situation may affect me, the effect is entirely personal. Once I am emotionally distressed by your experience, my mind or feelings aren't taking in your situations that triggered such feelings. For example, say you were to tell me how your dog died and I was reminded about my dog dying. I then began to talk about how my dog died and I began to get emotional. Your pain and emotion is now secondary to my own in my own head, whether I intended it to be or not. But let's get it clear, some people do try to explain how they understand your situation by recounting a situation that they were in, but this is different from personal distress. This is not necessarily being swept up in your own emotion, like with personal distress, but rather it's trying to prove to the other person that you do understand as a way to comfort them. Although this still isn't necessarily empathy, it is done with the same thought in mind and it is other orientated rather than being self-absorbed. A similar phenomenon to personal distress is emotional contagion, where simply being in the presence of people who are sharing and expressing some strong emotion is likely to see us being swept along in the same emotional current. Both empathy and sympathy are more complex than shared emotional distress, happening when we resonate with another person's feelings instead of when we project our own feelings. Sympathy can be defined as an emotional response stemming from another's emotional state or condition that is not identical to the other's emotion but consists of feeling sorrow or concern for another's welfare. A simple explanation that one of my friends once gave me was, whereas empathy puts me in your shoes, sympathy tells you that I've walked that journey. Sympathy is therefore me orientated and empathy is you orientated. These may be frustrating experiences where your friends will claim that they know what it's like to be in your situation, yet they are missing the point that they haven't experienced this situation as you, and therefore their reaction or feelings are based off of their own experience and don't necessarily correlate to your reactions or your feelings or the words that you would need to hear. 
empathy can also mean that objectivity is lost. I understand how you feel and I think this is a lot different from saying you feel hurt and upset possibly because. According to this analysis, sympathy, identification, projection and counter-transference can distort our perceptions and communications with each other. In contrast, empathy is a sense of knowing the other's mind without their state of mind being the same one as ours. At its most visceral, empathy is felt in the body. We physically feel the other's joys, fears or sadness and we know something of their world. Physical sensations can be felt as subjective feelings and subjective feelings can be thought about, both our own and those of somebody else. Empathy, therefore, can not only be the result of feeling but also a result of thinking, cognition as well as effect. It consists of effective and cognitive responses. Feeling what another person is feeling and understanding why that person feels as they do. Feshbach sees empathy as comprising three processes. The cognitive ability to recognise, perceive and discriminate emotional states in the other person. The more mature cognitive skills of seeing things from the other person's point of view. And an emotional response to or experience of the other's emotional state. Effective or emotional empathy get us close to what we generally understand as an empathic response. I feel your pain, I notice and sense your despair, but I'm clear that it is you who is in pain and despair, not me, even though I am being emotionally affected by your distress. This is another extent of what most people's empathy is or how they perceive being empathic. Cognitive empathy, however, is based on seeing, imagining and thinking about the situation from the other person's point of view. It involves a more cognitively based reflective process of understanding the other's perspective. Therefore, it would be important to have some knowledge of the other person's history, personality, circumstances and situation before we can set our minds to work imagining what it would be like to be that other person. Therefore, this involves actively thinking about the other person's mindset coupled with the capacity to feel the other's feelings. As you might be emotionally cut off from the situation because you're not living through it, it can be easy to see things as objective and not actually take into account how that other person would be feeling and respond based on their own personality and history. And because of this, a lot of people reckon they're empathising with people when they actually aren't. And it can get really frustrating when people don't see past their own self and their own experiences, even though you know that they are trying to help and they are trying to be empathic. I think that this concludes, therefore, that it is not enough to just be empathic or have that natural reaction. You must actively participate in empathy, both cognitively and emotionally, if you are to try and understand another person and help them through a difficult time. The greatest and therefore arguably most effective empathy then includes the combination of both effective and cognitive empathy. Furthermore, we must remember that empathy involves imagining another's psychological world whilst maintaining a clear self-other differentiation. And finally, empathy doesn't just include knowing what a person is feeling and feeling what that person is feeling, but also communicating, perhaps with compassion, the recognition and understanding of the other's emotional responses. I've done this with friends and the people that might not necessarily understand how empathy works can see this as a perceived state in the obvious. However, it is very effective when a friend comes to you to say, well, you're probably feeling like this because you've experienced this and you're also thinking about that, so that would also make you react like this. Talking through someone's mental state and their emotions can show that you do have an understanding of them. Even though it might be counterintuitive to just state the obvious, this can really help reaffirm people's experiences and make them them feel 
for lack of a better word, more valid. Hogan sees empathy as the intellectual or imaginative apprehensions of another's condition or state of mind. His concept attempts to capture our ability to recognise other people's personalities, emotional conditions, beliefs and desires in order to make sense of and predict and anticipate their behaviour. Thus, empathy might also be defined as the ability to identify what someone else is thinking or feeling and responding to their thoughts and feelings with the appropriate emotion, advice and solution. So although you must draw on your own experiences and your own feelings, it is important to detach how your mind works when you are empathising with someone. If you have this understanding of empathy then, which I hope you do since you're watching this video and I've just given a very lengthy explanation, you would think that it would be capable to learn these things and from the explanation it's actually wondrous why people don't be more empathetic. Although this kind of explains that empathy is something that we can learn and improve on, people's mindsets differ regarding the flexibility of important attributes such as personality and intelligence. And actually, it's the mindset that people have towards empathy that hinders their ability to be empathic. These mindsets lie along a scale between a fixed theory, we cannot develop our intelligence, and a malleable theory, we can develop our intelligence. For example, for people that believe in a fixed theory, challenge signals low ability, and because they believe attributes are fixed, this low ability cannot be developed. This would therefore hinder any attempt to learn or improve on a quality that you have. If we apply these mindsets to empathy then, they play an important role in how people respond to empathic challenges. To the extent that people with a fixed theory believe empathy is inherent and unchangeable, empathic challenges might make them question their ability to empathise and so it can affect their motivation to be an empathic person. And so, because of this, they may disengage from situations where empathy is difficult for them to experience. By contrast, because people with a malleable theory believe empathy can be developed, they should feel less threatened if being empathetic is challenging to them in a certain situation. When confronted with situations in which empathy is difficult for them to experience, they can attempt to overcome these challenges by expending effort. In a series of studies, researchers tested and found support for the hypothesis that people's mindsets of empathy affect whether they expend effort to engage in empathy in challenging situations. They found that participants holding a more malleable theory of empathy typically expended more empathic effort in contexts where empathy is challenging. For example, when they disagree with someone or it's someone that they do not know or do not like that is suffering. And these people typically persist more in trying to feel empathy when they do not immediately experience it. This research demonstrates that one way to respond to empathic challenges is to expend additional effort to feel empathy, highlighting the importance of people's mindsets of empathy and predicting this empathic effort. Therefore, like I said before, it must be an active and deliberate experience that you are giving your all to if you want to be more empathic. But why be empathic? Some people just don't want to be. What is the reason to putting ourselves through that emotional and mental toll to be there for other people? Well, if you're driven by being a good person or morality, then that is why. Great claims have also been made for empathy's ability to make us good, moral, connected and civilised. It is in our efforts to live well among others that behaviours arise that we describe as moral. A successful social life requires moral codes and values, otherwise living well together is difficult. And you can almost tell who has had to live with people and make compromises and who hasn't by their ability to empathise with certain situations. The inevitable conflict between self-interest and desires and the welfare of others therefore has to be negotiated if social life is to be made possible and social problems are to be solved. And it's often this lack of negotiation which causes rifts in friendships. I know for myself that is definitely a thing. To understand morality, we must acknowledge the possibility of tensions arising between reason
feeling and emotion. Reason may tell us why something is going on and what might be done, but it is emotion that drives us to act. In this sense, morality actually develops out of our emotional lives, and we learn to moderate our wants and desires as we recognise and come up against the wants and desires of others. Two moral principles have close ties to the presence of empathy, caring for others, and principles of fairness and justice. The more we recognise and understand the other's point of view, the more likely it is that we will be fair, compassionate, and moral. It's likely that the kind of world that most of us would want to live in has a presence of fair play and justice. We could argue, therefore, that an empathic and rational citizenry would increase behaviour that is caring and just, and that caring and just behaviour makes for a good society. Over the centuries, most societies, religions, and traditions have recognised the wisdom of treating others as you would have them treat you. Every single one of the major traditions, whether it be ones like Buddhism and Hinduism, as well as the monotheisms of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, have taught that empathy has a spiritual dimension in which our own suffering is related to that of others. Though I don't believe in necessarily following all that is said in a religious book, there are some really, really good morals that you can learn from religious teachings. Perhaps the most powerful statement of this moral injunction is from the Jewish Torah. Do not do unto others as you would not have done unto you. Armstrong believes that this is actually more demanding than Jesus's do unto others as you would have done unto you, as it requires that we refrain from doing harm to others. We therefore need to look into our own hearts and discover what hurts us, and then refrain from inflicting similar pain or damage onto other people. Rules that apply to everyone and thinking about everyone in terms of suffering allow us actions to be justifiable and moral. For example, who would think being a slave as anything as unpleasant? Who wouldn't be outraged if they couldn't vote because of their sex or skin colour? Our ability to imagine and feel the world from the other's point of view is likely to soften our feelings and reduce inhibited wants and encourage mutual benefit. Many studies support the suggestion that empathy, prosocial behaviours and care orientated moral reasoning are related. Less empathic individuals are less likely to be selfless and other orientated. The more someone is empathically aware of another's plight, the more likely it is that they will help and the more quickly they are likely to help. But different people faced with the same situation vary in how intensely they experience empathic distress. Empathy may not necessarily lead to sympathy or prosocial behaviour. For some people, simply holding very clear notions of quality, fairness and justice can lead to altruistic and prosocial behaviour. And here comes a problem. It is true that the more people are encouraged to imagine themselves being in a similar situation to another person, the higher their empathy, and so the greater chance of their altruistic behaviour, but the extent to which we identify with the plight of others can be influenced. Therefore, even though encouraging people to be empathic might actually help, it's not always a solid solution. Batson observed that the more similarities there are between people, the higher their empathy and the more likely it is that they will act selflessly. The more alike people are in terms of gender, education, culture and economic status, the higher is their empathy. And the more people identify with a particular group, whether that be family, work, ethnicity, class or age, the more likely it is to, that they will view fellow members of the group favourably and then they will act more pro-socially. Empathy therefore rises and falls depending on whether the other is one of us or one of them, a member of the in-group or not. This might not always make for sound judgement or lead to moral agreement, as it can be self-interest derived. And this might not even be an active way of thinking about the world. 
sadly, as humans, we tend to like what we know and we find little comfort in what we find strange. If acting morally suggests following universal norms of just, fair and proper conduct, the other's culture, gender or education should make no difference either to our judgement or our behaviour. Furthermore, for many philosophers, empathy is too unpredictable a feeling on which to base our entire moral code. One way out of this slightly troubling position is to note one of Batson's other findings. The more we are encouraged to imagine what it must be like to be someone else in a particular situation, the more likely it is that we will be empathetic. Cognitive effort, or thinking what it must be like to be that other person in that particular situation, therefore can increase emotional empathy. And this is why I believe that it's not enough just to have effective empathy, we must also actively be cognitive in our empathy. Based on raising empathic awareness, people's willingness to act morally can be improved when people are asked or encouraged to take the moral perspective of the other. Much empathic feeling is emotional, automatic and involuntary and it seems hardwired into our makeup. But Hoffman, for example, has a position on moral action that represents an attempt to combine our emotional and cognitive capabilities to recognise the value of both our empathic and our rational characters as we attempt to negotiate our relationships and understand people and their perspectives. So we've covered what empathy is, where it came from and its definitions. We've covered the capability of empathy, how to encourage it and the restrictions, but how can we actually apply this to something? If we simply define empathy as the capability to both understand the feelings of the other, feel them ourselves, but see the feelings from their perspective and consider how it must affect them as an individual, how can this help in online spaces or real life relationships? If we are to focus on online spaces, one of the most popular discourses at the moment is around the awareness of feelings of others, specifically around the language you use and the topics that you talk about. In particular, there is this culture developing around the awareness of triggers, trigger warnings and the importance of politically correct language and refrainment from using offensive slurs that you cannot reclaim. Many seem to be of the mindset that people are demanding trigger warnings or feeding into a society of snowflakes and accuse political correctness and refusal to freely say words that are derogatory as censorship. I mean, some people say that being blocked on Twitter is censorship, so that's kind of the IQ level we're dealing with. For those who see it that way, it's highly probable that they lack empathy for those who have their own triggers and those that are affected by the weight of slurs. Trigger and content warnings first emerged in fan cultures surrounding media properties. In TV fandom, trigger warnings have been used to mark fan production since at least the early 2000s, but explicit warning labels are not a new phenomenon, and the concept of content warnings dates from parental concerns about violence in comic books in the 1950s. By the 1980s, this had spread to concern over sex, drugs and violence in popular music, and by the 1990s, distributors of television programmes and movies had adopted the routine use of explicit warnings. For all of those who fault the seemingly new use of trigger warnings online, and for those that support and call for these warnings to become more mainstream, there is a surprise lack of engagement with the voluminous scholarly work surrounding trauma, ranging from early psychoanalytic accounts of hysteria, shell shock and melancholia, to more recent trauma theory developed in humanities and social sciences. Across this work, there is a consistent understanding of trauma as something that is not simply translated into content. It is very often described as unrepresentable, unsignifiable and irrational. The term trigger is rooted in the field of mental health with a diagnosis of post-traumatic stress disorder. PTSD is an anxiety disorder that may develop after the person is exposed to an event involving actual or potential grave physical 
harm. People who suffer from PTSD may have trauma triggers which cause them to uncontrollably recall and relive their traumatic experiences. Trauma triggers are inherently personal, so they are not the same for any two people. They may be associated with smell or taste or sights, and triggers can result in a number of symptoms, from intrusive thoughts to avoidance of reminders and angry outbursts, and can be disruptive to learning and working. The term trigger has been used as shorthand signifier for the stimulus that causes a return to the automatic stress reaction that individuals experience. And whilst the cause of the trauma is highly variable, the response in human beings is consistent. Intrusive reliving of the event, disassociation, or numbing. Other responses can include irritable behaviour and angry outbursts, reckless or self-destructive behaviour, hypervigilance, exaggerated startle response, concentration problems, and sleep disturbances. The trigger creates what is referred to as a sensitised hyperarousal response, in which an extreme bodily stress response results from a generalised reminder from the initial traumatic event. This stress is inherently biological. It consists of a flood of hormones issuing automatically like cortisol and adrenaline, opiates and oxytocin. This psychological response mimics the stress of the original trauma. When someone is truly triggered, therefore, the experience is extremely unpleasant and beyond their control. From this description, it makes sense why people would want certain content trigger warned. That is, if you're capable of extending an element of empathy. Though there seems to be a focus here on triggers not being representative of the things that people experience, that doesn't mean to rule out that the possibility of stories, videos, tweets, blogs, books, or any other media that may refer to an experience that was unpleasant are not capable of being triggers. As triggers differ from person to person, the simple mention of a topic might actually be enough to stimulate a trauma response of some kind. Whether that be the extreme bodily response or the prompting of intrusive thoughts and distressing emotions. And let me be clear, just because you're not undergoing a full-on reliving of the physical and emotional trauma doesn't mean intrusive thoughts aren't extremely distressing to experience. So although there is science to back this, it's surprising how many people mock these things and mock the fact that people trigger warn their own content, especially in online spaces like on Twitter and YouTube. A lot of the reading that I did for this video centres around the use of trigger warnings in universities university contexts and in schooling. And yeah, I'm gonna be honest, there was a lot of trigger warnings in my degree and in my education at secondary school level. This gave people the choice to sit out of an event if they felt like it would be detrimental to them. And I don't think that this really affected anyone other than saving people's feelings, which is very beneficial, especially when you're in a school or university environment. And it's even weirder that people find a problem with people referencing triggers just in case someone doesn't want to read something that might upset them online. Despite the fact that content warnings have been a common thing across media for over half a century. Much, if not most, of material on TV and in cinemas has been pre-screened and assigned a code to indicate the appropriate age of potential viewers. For example, a PG movie warns parents that some of the material in a film might not be appropriate for young children, or an R-rated film or age restriction such as 12A, 15, or 18 in the UK restricts the screening to audiences over the certain age. The Motion Picture Association of America produced their ratings in the mid-1960s after removing an older system of censorship known as the Hayes Code. Whereas the Hayes Code, which dates back to the 1930s, prescribed what could 
could and could not be shown. For example, you could show a married couple in single beds, but not in a double bed. You couldn't show homosexuality or alcoholism. The new ratings were supposed to be recommendations and warnings rather than limitations. Given the way that we now use these codes to prejudge the content of the films that we watch, it's strange that trigger warnings strike so many people as intrusive and prescriptive. In a media landscape full of warnings about explicit lyrics, violent imagery, raunchy humour and nudity, what makes a trigger warning inflammatory? The trigger warning has been presumed to a certain extent to produce putative viewers or listeners who want to know what it is to come in class or online because they fear their reaction to such material and wish either to mentally prepare to engage with it or to avoid it altogether. Here comes the idea that trigger warnings coddle people, that they shield people from the world, when in actual fact they are simply shielding someone from a traumatic response. A traumatic response that they did not ask for, they probably wish they could be without and they likely have little to no control over. Those who are insensitive to trigger warnings view this as a new level of sensitivity to explicit materials online. While some content warnings, such as asking for some indication about what lies ahead on a blind digital trail, are quite reasonable, given how much explicit material circulates on screen nowadays, critiques propose the need to question the relations between explicit representations and trauma. Jack Halberstam, for example, argues that triggering is a term that conceals a complex response system that operates in all of us as we navigate the world. But instead of defending viewers and students from difficult material, the trigger warning boils all explicit material down to assaultive imagery, while at the same time it reduces the viewer to a defenceless, passive and inert spectator who has no barriers between themselves and the flow of the images that populate their world. Let's highlight that this guy used a feminine example of who is affected and used herself and her in this description, keeping up with the sexist stereotype that women are easily upset. The argument is trigger warning content makes the content triggering, instead of the content being trigger warned because it is already triggering. Triggering. And yes, it is true that depictions of assault and sexual violence might not make you relive your own assault and sexual violence. And the extremities to which these are presented online can have various different effects. But the fact of the matter is, sensitive subjects can be triggering regardless of how well, how correctly or how abstractly they are presented, because it is a personal response that people can't control. It's not not something that can be measured or predicted, so surely it is safer just to trigger warn anything that might include a reference to something that could cause a triggered response. But the response that the explicit material being warned is not triggering because of its content, but rather because of this new millennial Gen Z snowflake response has dubbed it so, it's a demonstration of either a lack of empathy present or a demonstration of a refusal to show empathy to those who would be affected. With one of the major points of discussion also being around political correctness, we need to engage in the conversation around the use of slurs. Now, the discussion of this will be more brief because I'm not necessarily affected by their usage and I don't want to speak on behalf of people that are. Slurs are typically derogatory terms used to degrade marginalised communities based on race, sexuality, ethnicity and sex gender correlation. These terms are reclaimed by these communities in an attempt to reclaim the power and the weight of these words when used by an oppressor. There are sexist slurs against women, but these are not necessarily regarded to carry the same weight as other slurs and are now more associated with profanity and swearing. But with the terms such as whore, slut, bitch, women and non-men have also tried to reduce the weight of them by using them in a positive light or removing the stigma from being promiscuous. With racial and homophobic slurs, for example, 
the usage of them when you don't belong to a specific group will be regarded as racist or homophobic. If you say the n-word and you are not black for example, people will regard that as racist and some people might even say that you individually are racist. Like I said, it's not my place to speak on behalf of a community that I'm not from and you can argue all you want about whether the use of a word is racist, if it's context-based or if uttering a word makes you a racist, but if it is something that a community were oppressed by, I think you should probably listen to their thoughts before you make up your own. In a previous video, I explained how opinions can be transphobic and the ways that you can discuss things can be transphobic, and that might not necessarily make you someone who is against trans rights or the most transphobic person on the planet, but there is enough to say that your use of language is offensive and derogatory and that that is a problem regardless of whether it is actually representative of the way you see the community. And this is where the discourse from the start of the video returns again and empathy goes out the window. I have a gay friend and he doesn't mind when I say it or but my black friend gave me the n-word pass or I am from x community and it doesn't bother me so stop getting worked up about it. For the latter claim I understand this anger if a member of a marginalised group is getting annoyed at white knighting, but even so, just because something doesn't bother you, it doesn't mean it won't bother someone else, in the same way that if something bothers you, it doesn't mean that it will bother someone else. You can't expect people not to get bothered by something just because it doesn't bother you, in the same way that you're getting annoyed that people would assume that you're bothered by it, but you're not, just because other people in similar groups as you are. So now we've got a background of slurs and trigger warnings then, how does this relate to empathy? How can we apply empathy? What well, even it was the point of bringing up these examples in a video about empathy? The surrounding discourse around trigger warnings and political correctness, such as the refrainment from using slurs, doesn't need to be one that criticises someone's oversensitivity. Too often the argument of how would you feel is derailed by I wouldn't care, and that seems well enough to justify why someone is criticising a trigger warning or upset over a slur. And yes, it is important to make the relevant scientific arguments surrounding trigger warnings. And yes, it is important to acknowledge the weight of derogatory slurs and how they were used and still are used to degrade non-white people, non-cis people, non-heterosexuals, those who aren't able-bodied or neurodivergent, and so many more. But an even simpler argument and solution can be thrown into the mix that doesn't include throwing various amounts of scientific studies and scholarly articles on discrimination. Empathy. Everyone can be taught what empathy is, why it's a good thing with the various arguments made in this video, and how it can be worked on, such as opening your mind to realising you can improve on yourself, and trying to physically and emotionally engage yourself in other people's experiences. Although, there will be people that argue that empathy is not enough if it comes to those who are fighting injustice. Yeah, I hear you on that one. Empathy regarding homophobia isn't going to make existing homophobia go away, but it might prevent someone from saying something that could be considered homophobic if they knew of its effects and tried to empathise with another person's experience. It's a method of prevention rather than eradication and it's not the only thing that we should do to end injustice, but one of the actions that could hypothetically promote prevention in contingency with other solutions. Often people, especially on Twitter, get caught up with it's a free world and I can say what I want and and then they argue that they shouldn't be censored and free speech and usually they go on about how American 
rights or whatever. They argue that they shouldn't have to refrain from using certain words, that they shouldn't have their freedom restricted, and they shouldn't have to abide by the rules for a bunch of sensitive children who didn't know what it was like to be in a Call of Duty lobby. I don't always trigger warning my tweets, for example, because I'm under the presumption that on Twitter you can mute trigger words. I do try to trigger my YouTube content, but sometimes that will slip through the cracks because I'm only human. However, if someone asked me to, I wouldn't fault them. Instead, I would try to see it from their point of view before I decide on how I respond. Sure, there may be some that I can't empathise with, so I may politely explain, but all of this is just simple human decency. It's not impossible to show consideration for others, especially if they are polite in their request of it. It's not censorship to know that an individual is made uncomfortable by a discussion of certain topics so you don't talk about that topic when they're in your company. It's called compassion. It's called being a good person. And maybe with a little bit of empathy, there would be a lot more good people in this world especially in an online space. If you don't understand someone's trauma, if you don't understand someone's triggers, if you don't understand someone's feelings, that's okay, but at least begin to make the effort to be a more empathic person, and maybe then people will be a lot less upset with your responses to them when they're in an emotional state. Thank you for watching this video on empathy. Please like and subscribe if you did enjoy this video, and leave your comments below on what you think about empathy and whether you think it would be a good way Way to increase a level of understanding and kindness in this world. Thanks for watching and with that I'll see you soon.